Hey folks, hacking this and that back again to talk about some sensors. And uh, this time I actually want to talk about sensor as a business. Uh, chatted with a, a number of people over the last couple of weeks on Discord, and you know they're they're like, oh yeah, you know, using the network. How do I get started? What do I do? Where do I start? Um, and it's great to want to get into sensors. I'd love everybody to get into sensors. Using the network is how we grow the network. Um, but often they're sort of stuck. And where do I start? What what do I what do I want to get into? Um, how do I build a business out of it? Um, so I'm going to sort of first walk you through how I got started in it, um, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of ideas that I've got. Um, and really, the there's a great big world out there. I am not going to take over the cold storage industry single-handedly. Uh, feel free to take my idea, build your own solution, and chase your own market. Uh, I probably will never cross paths with your clients. It's just the the reality that there's a great big world out there, and there's a lot of need for sensors and sensor data to help businesses make better choices. So, uh, what did I do? So, I ended up having a conversation with a good friend of mine who runs a local restaurant and went to see him one day and he was on his hands and knees in front of a uh, ref ref uh, freezer, yeah, freezer, um, cleaning up a mess. The freezer had lost power over the weekend and over the course of 48 hours, the content of that freezer had spoiled. Two to three thousand dollars worth of inventory was thrown out. He had to close for the day because he had nothing to sell. Uh, he had to sit around waiting for uh, the supplier to show up with supply and restock. Uh, so that one day, when you consider the losses, the purchase of new inventory, uh, loss of business, uh, was a massive hit to his restaurant. Um, so I started thinking about this going, I, I'm building this sensor network. There's got to be a solution to this. Now, I've been doing sensors for a long time. Uh, my entire home is smart. Uh, I've got occupancy sensors in my office. I've got occupancy sensors in hallways and laundry rooms so that if somebody l turns the light on, is in the room for, say, 10 or 15 minutes, and then leaves between the sensor and my smart home, it goes, oh, well, I haven't seen any motion in that room for the last 10 minutes. I'm going to turn that light off. So I'm sitting there thinking, I've got these Dragino sensors already deployed in my hotspot housings. I'm monitoring temperature of the, the enclosure so that I know if I'm frying my hotspot or if I'm freezing my hotspot. Well, if I can do that with a hotspot, why can't I do it with frozen meat? So I spent a little more time thinking about it and looking at sort of the options on the uh, on the network for data collection. Obviously, that's console uh, data gathering and monitoring and logging. Well, I'd already been doing that with uh, Data Cake and my devices because all of these are feeding data into a report so I can actually look at my hotspot and go, oh, well, that poor thing's been sitting in the direct sun for the last eight hours and it's now, you know, 70 degrees centigrade inside of that, uh, that hotspot or that housing. So I took the idea and I went back to see my buddy and I said, what if I could turn around and put a sensor on every one of your freezers monitor the temperature to make sure it's within that food safe zone. And if it deviates from that food safe zone, send an alert to your phone. And he was like, hell yeah, sign me up. So I went back and I spent a little time thinking about how to build this, how to integrate it into a cloud platform that has the ability to do push notification, SMS. I'm actually going to go so far because of the type of uh, clientele that I'm targeting with this, uh, they're often entrepreneurs or franchise owners. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, 
uh, if their phone goes off, are they going to hear it? What if I turn around and integrated a push notification to something like Twilio that actually calls their cell phone with an automated message? Uh, so these are things I'm working through on mine. I'm not 100% launched just yet. I, I would happily show you my website uh, if I was, but I'm just I'm flying under the radar right now because I've got two pilot projects that I'm working on uh, with a couple of restaurants and a not-for-profit food uh, pantry, so like a food bank, uh, that also does a breakfast and hot meal program as well. So just like a restaurant, they have product that they need to maintain, take care of, and prepare and serve appropriately. So that's where I'm going with these cold storage sensors. So what else can you do with that? Ironically, I have a fellow that I have been buying meat from for probably 10 years. He's one of these traveling meat guys. Uh, so he shows up at my place about every three months with his van full of uh, frozen meat and I just buy him bulk. So looking at his freezer and his mobile unit, I started having a conversation with him and I said, when you go to the, the warehouse and you load up, is there any audit trail for the product you have on your van after you leave? And to my surprise, he's actually responsible for the product the minute he signs it out. It is technically his at that point. So the, the, the freezer he has has an alarm on it so that if it goes above temperature, it starts beeping at him. Well, it's pretty easy when it's you know two feet behind you in the van uh, to hear that. So I talked to him a little more and I went, okay, so you've got warehouses full of frozen product and you've got mobile units full of frozen product, but in the end, it's still the company's brand reputation that's on the line, whether it's the boss that owns the product or the driver that owns the product. So I started thinking and then I went, these are the Dragino uh, industrial grade sensors. So. Imagine everything that's inside one of these guys, just in a more durable, uh, rugged case, nice long probe. This one's actually uh, fired up for, or wired up uh, for a hot temp, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But this kind of sensor in a mobile unit monitoring those freezers. These guys exist all over the world. It's not my guy, but the, this business model exists all over the world. So these guys are out there doing cold storage. Back to my not-for-profit uh, food, um, yeah, food pantry. They also have a refrigerated truck. So end-to-end -end mobile cold chain storage. Just because somebody's moving it doesn't mean it has or it, it can be outside of that food safe zone. Depends on whether it's refrigerated or frozen as to what the temperatures are. Think about bigger companies, uh, Cisco Food, Gordon Food. Uh, these guys are responsible for maintaining the temperature of their vans as well. Uh, a large organization like that probably has already invested in a solution. Look for the smaller guys, the guys that are trying to find the competitive advantage and offer this to them that you don't have to be a giant Cisco or a giant Gordon food uh, to offer cold chain storage. The other thing that uh, I'm doing with this one in particular, uh, back to my restaurant owner and uh, one of the other conversations I had with him, he wakes up at three in the morning and can't remember where, whether he turned the oven off. And since he has no way of checking remotely, he literally gets dressed, drives down to the restaurant, walks in and goes, yep, the oven's off, and then go back home and try to go back to sleep. By adding a hot temp sensor to his oven and integrating it into my solution, he can monitor both cold and hot temperatures. The other thing to consider, I was recently on vacation in, uh, in Scotland visiting some friends, chatting with some people, and 
not just Scotland, all over the world, wet basements are a problem. And this little guy is a water sensor. It can actually um, be picked up for about 18 to $22. Mount a couple of these in a basement. I actually use this one on a flat roof as the uh, storm drain on the roof can get uh, plugged up with debris. Water starts to back up and, and sitting on this flat roof. So I set this up about six or so feet away from the drain heads. And if the probe gets wet, then I know that there's now at least an inch of standing water on that roof. At that point, somebody needs to go down to the building and clear that drain head. If I let it build up, eventually it's going to start finding the top of the membrane and finding ways to get into the building. So basements, rooftops, water sensing. Um, what else can you do? The obvious and uh, a lot of people talk about it, tracking. Uh, whether it's using a mapper or a home-built GPS or a uh, Broan tracker. A lot of people are curious about GPS tracking. Now, you're probably going to look around and go, but there's big blank areas of coverage. I actually have been in GPS tracking for almost 20 years. I started GPS tracking as a hobby and then tried to launch a business prematurely for the market. Um, and have continued to track my own personal vehicles and family vehicles. G Helium coverage right now, especially in North America, reminds me a lot of 3G coverage when I was first getting into GPS tracking. I remember doing a road trip down to Florida, and I'm going to say it was probably the entire state of West Virginia. I had no coverage, or at least I had no tracking data. I'm sure there was probably cell service there. It just wasn't compatible with my tracker. These are early days for tracking. Th that's just a reality. But it doesn't mean that the market doesn't exist. GPS tracking has been a billion dollar industry year over year uh, with good or moderate coverage. Having dead spots is not the end of a business opportunity. Keeping things localized can help alleviate that. So whether it's tracking family cars, knowing where your kids are, that kind of stuff, don't be afraid to look at GPS tracking. The other thing you might say is, oh, well, there's this guy, and yes, sorry, Neil, I'm going to pick on you, uh, that has already hit the market with GPS tracking. How can I compete against him? Uh, the first option is you know, talk to him. Maybe there's a licensing opportunity. I have no personal interest in getting into GPS tracking myself. I've been there. Uh, it's a great industry, but it's not what I'm passionate about right now. Um, the other is Neil's just a guy in the UK. Uh, he's maybe got first mover advantage, uh, got a great website, a great app. I do actually use his app. I've been helping him beta test it right from the get go. And the reality is he's not going to take over the world. He might have plans to, um, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't start where you are. Maybe you're down in Australia. I, I'll tell you that Neil's going to take a while to get down to Australia. Anyway, enough picking on Neil. Um, the other thing on GPS tracking is people are talking about tracking uh, elderly, tracking kids, uh, tracking individuals with special needs. Um, but then they also want to get into tracking pets, dogs and cats in particular. We are close, and this is more of a sensor development than a, than a helium network issue, um, because size and battery life are always in competition with, with each other. Think about, you know, flying drones. Why can you get like 20 minutes on some drones, 40 minutes on other drones? Size. The reality is if you want a good tracker, you need to have a battery life that's going to be more than, and I would say double, its utility cycle. 
So if you have a uh, person that you want to monitor, a uh, child with special needs, chances are that he's not going to go out um, for more than a day. So if you've got a tracking device that can do several days, two, three, that's a great battery life. If you have a dog that only goes out in the backyard or goes free roaming for the day, again, two to three days. Um, when it comes to asset tracking, you definitely want to get longer battery life on that. Nobody wants to visit a vehicle or say a, a trailer every other week to replace batteries in it. So the problem right now will always be size and battery. Talk about cats. Could you imagine trying to fit something like this on your cat? Um, the Broan tab is a nice little unit key fob size. If you've got a big hefty cat, maybe it fits on him. If you've got a medium to, to large dog, definitely works on him. If you've got a little chihuahua, that poor dog is going to be feeling like he's strangled uh, with that on there. So there is tech coming. I've seen prototypes. I've seen early um, releases of tracking components. Again, it always comes down to battery. Think of even electric cars, range to battery size. That's the battle we're in right now. We will continue to figure out ways to make sensors uh, consume less power, and hopefully battery tech continues to enhance of capacity versus size, but they are coming. So don't, don't be distraught uh, with that and think that the industry is impossible. It's coming soon. Um... Why I, uh, oh, right. Um, I don't own them, but another industry that uh, is very popular is um, AgriSci. So somewhere around here, I did have, oh, soil sensors. Um, the soil industry, agribusiness, you've got to be careful on your crop yield revenue. Um, so I talked to some friends. Uh, one actually happens to be in the um, soil yeah, soil institute, international. Anyway, he's a dirt brain. Passionate about soil, maintaining good soil, care of the soil, that kind of stuff. Talked to him for a bit. Talked to a couple local farmers. Utility crop is not where you want to start. There is no margin in corn and soy and wheat to allow for investment in digital sensor technology. It's just too too narrow of a margin. The data is probably going to be fabulous. It'll probably help make decisions for farmers and um, how to adapt to certain situations based on the information, say, from last year. If you want to play a long game, definitely um, soil uh, information, uh, moisture, uh, VWC and EC are great. Uh, NPK, and I know I'm throwing a lot of acronyms. If you're into dirt, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I would encourage, if you're going to get into AgriSci for sensors, find some... some uh, AgriSci students, professionals, uh, and learn as much as you can from them. My, my dirt buddy, brilliant guy, totally understands the uh, nature of caring for the soil. And the, the organization he works for is very focused on how to maintain sustainable uh, soil for crop growth. Maybe you want to zoom down a little to something a little more smaller. This is an idea I also had, and that is community gardens. There might even be option for subsidy funding on these on this particular idea if your community is promoting community gardens and food sustainability. But if you find a community garden project, and we have some around here, um, there's one actually a few blocks uh, down the street from me, and get in there. Find out, in our situation, they have uh, a garden captain. 
The garden captain is responsible for negotiating with the city to set up the garden, getting the garden built, and registering um, community members to plant in the garden. You want to become best friends with a garden captain and then offer the ability for the gardeners to access a portal where they can monitor their garden. Um, things that you can monitor, monitor there is how much water is in the, uh, the water bucket, if they have a um, water reclamation system. If they don't have sort of fresh water access, that's going to be important to them. Uh, soil moisture, you'd be surprised how many hobby uh, gardeners just kill their crop because they're overwatering. Um, so set up uh, soil moisture monitoring, get the good ones. Don't don't go for the the inexpensive, I'll call them, uh, sensors because they do erode. And then you're throwing them, at least the, the sensor probe, throwing them away every so often. Um, so community gardens, that's another option. One last point to this, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, when I've started talking to people about sensors, one of my favorite expressions was, look around your place of work, your friend's place of work, and find the manual tasks that you can eliminate to save both money and collect data responsibly. A classic example is a lot of pharmacies will have cold storage where they will keep uh, various medication, insulin, etc., and they are required by legislation to record and monitor the temperature of that storage on a regular basis. Most of them will probably have a dollar store thermometer stuck to the front of the fridge and a probe inside. Forget accuracy. I don't even want to pretend that those things are accurate. But they're supposed to go by, for us, it's every 30 minutes and record the temperature in that fridge. I have stood in line longer than that at my pharmacy and noticed that nobody recorded the temperature. I'm sure it gets done periodically throughout the day, maybe, let's say, half a dozen times. And then, again, I don't want to call them out as being evil or cheating the system or just being, you know, rule breakers, uh, but I would suspect that they probably fudge some numbers in between to fill out their audit log. Somebody's going to ask to see that log, and if it only has six out of the you know required uh, 52 uh, record, recorded intervals, they're going to get in trouble. So, back to my little fa favorite uh, Dragino sensor. Stick this on the side of the fridge, put the probe inside, and set it for a 20-minute recording interval. Automatically spits out reports at the end of the day, end of the week, whatever interval the uh, the pharmacy needs great way to eliminate manual effort that is often neglected in businesses so i hope i've given you some ideas actually you know what one more environmental office space large corporations big uh, buildings will have enviros monitoring systems and management systems building management systems uh, don't try to compete against those the smaller guys who probably could use some environmental space temperature information to let the maintenance crew know that something's wrong with the HVAC. So back to my, my building with the wet roof, um, put these two or three on a floor, monitor the temperature, saves getting that phone call from a tenant that goes, hey, uh, it's 30 degrees in here and I think the AC is broken. Uh, another great option, build it as a service. Sell it to the buildings. Don't sell sensors to the buildings. Sell the service. Monthly recurring revenue is where you are going to get your long-term uh, ROI. So, all that being said, I'm going to wrap up now. Hopefully I've given you some brilliant ideas that you're going to hit the ground running. If you have any scenarios or sensors or questions, feel free to reach out to me on Discord, hacking this and that. Uh, I'm 
I'm around. People know where to find me. And uh, good luck with your project. Have an awesome day.